This week, Security Weekly co-host Tyler Robinson joins us to discuss balancing blockchain security with inevitable human error. Then Brandon Williams from Ping Identity joins us to talk about the state of identity in the enterprise. Finally, in the enterprise security news, security automation startup Survey raises $12 million. Virtual CISO startup Synomi raises $3.5 million to help SMBs automate cybersecurity. Keeper Security acquires Glyptodon, which I'm fairly certain that means they, uh, I'm pretty sure they haven't purchased the remains of an ancient long extinct armadillo. Security Scorecard acquires LIFARS, I think that's how you would say that, a DFIR consulting firm. And there's a rumor that Microsoft is considering picking up Mandiant with all the extra cash still laying around after the Activision Blizzard purchase. DHS launches the first uh, cybersecurity review board, first ever cybersecurity review board. Very interesting. A lot of uh, familiar names on that. All that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Endpoint security is designed to protect every device in your fleet, wherever it may be. These days, that can be a lot of different places. Find out how HP Wolf Security uses emerging strategies like application isolation, along with a zero trust approach and framework to give you a powerful, manageable, usable solution to your growing and increasingly spread out security challenges. Learn how HP Wolf Security can make a difference across your endpoints at securityweekly.com forward slash HP Wolf. Attackers are only getting more proficient, so how can you proactively adapt your cybersecurity strategy? Core Security by Help Systems helps you uncover and prioritize the risks that pose the biggest threat to your organization. Core Impact is a penetration testing tool that safely finds and exploits vulnerabilities using the same techniques as attackers. You can conduct advanced pen tests with ease using certified exploits and automations. Take your engagements to the next level by pairing with Cobalt Strike, a threat emulation tool ideal for adversary simulations and red team operations. Operations. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash core security. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly and a happy Plimsoll Day. I'll explain that in a little bit. This is episode 260, recorded on Thursday, February 10th, 2022. I'm your host, Adrian Sanabria, and joining me is Katie Teitler. How are you, Katie? I'm well. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. And also with us for this segment, we had to switch things up a little bit here. Uh, we had uh, someone, our first interview had a family emergency, so we are going to reschedule that. And instead today, I, I actually watched Paul Security Weekly last night, and they had some fascinating uh, chats on there last night. Highly recommend you check out that uh, episode. I don't have the episode number uh, right now, but it would be the one that just came out yesterday, the most recent. 727 would be the number of that one. Uh, a little voice tells me in my head. And um, yeah, so I invited uh, Tyler Robinson to jump on here and, and have a chat with us about um, uh, blockchain and, and crypto NFTs, all that stuff in general. And uh, he often comes on here and helps us out when uh, Tyler Shields can't make it. And today he is our interview guest. We also have joining us, uh, though, Lee. Mr. Lee from uh, Paul Security Weekly is with us as well, Mr. Lee Neely. So hello, Tyler. Hello, Lee. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me and, and inviting me to join. It's going to be yeah, interesting. Thank you. It's going to be fun. It, it is. But before we start that conversation, I want to explain what Plimsoll Day is. Apparently, there was not any kind of special cake or cocktail for us to celebrate today. There's no international day for red velvet cake or uh, for German upside down cake or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, there was a really interesting one that I went uh, down the rabbit hole a little bit uh, with. I'd never heard of Plimsoll Day, but it's uh, it's an um, celebrates an important moment in the history of maritime safety. So there was once a uh, common practice where greedy merchants, uh, especially in the UK, would overload their ships, uh, increasing the chance that they'd lose them in storms uh, in rough weather at sea. This practice led to these ships being referred to as coffin ships. 
So enter Samuel Plimsoll, a 19th century English member of parliament or an MP for uh, uh, shorts for folks who prefer the shorthand version. Uh, he was uh, once poor in his life, and he spent uh, a lot of his life uh, in public service uh, fight, fighting for you know the the kinds of uh, seamen that who would lose their lives on these coffin ships uh, when they were overloaded by merchants. So he got this uh, this bill called the Unseaworthy Ships Bill passed that basically created standards for ships. You can't overload it; it needs to be repaired properly, maintained properly, and um, also resulted in uh, marking on the side of ships so you could actually see uh, when they were fully loaded. You know, so these markings would tell you that it's fully loaded based on what kind of water they were in. You know, warmer water, water versus colder water has different densities, so you have different lines for for things like that. And that became known as the Plimsoll line. And um, do we have an image there to show? Were you able to load that up, Goose? I was thinking if only we had a plimsoll line for tech debt, but I, I had an image of, of what the uh, plimsoll line looked like. But basically, like I said, it's it's a series of lines, and it actually has different ones for different types of waters. So like tropical waters has its own line. Yeah, so TF is uh, uh, tropical something. I forget what the F is. But basically, you go from the warmest waters to the coldest waters. Like WNA is like... Um, north arctic like winter north arctic uh, so those are the coldest waters and due to uh, some and, uh, fancy googling uh the tf is for tropical fresh water f for fresh water fresh. for tropical water s for salt water in summer w for salt water in winter wna for winter in north atlantic and lr for lloyd's register okay yeah, so yeah, Lloyd's was actually involved in getting this passed because they would insure the ship. So obviously they, they don't want the ships to sink either. So it was somebody uh, that uh, Samuel Plimsoll was able to get uh, a lot of data from as he, he pushed this bill. So yeah, I thought, I thought it was really interesting. And, and I was thinking about, you know, how do, we, how do we map this over to cybersecurity? And I was thinking, uh, like, it would be great to have a Plimsoll line for tech debt. You know, IT, you can't buy any new things until you get rid of, you know, Oracle e-business suite or something like that. <laughs> You're below the below the waterline. You guys are drowning. All right, we do have one announcement here, and then we'll get into the conversation. Uh, the call for papers is now open for InfoSec World 2022, featuring expert insights, enlightening keynotes, and interactive breakout sessions. This year's conference will take place on September 26th through September 28th in Orlando, Florida. We're looking for experts and innovators to contribute their ideas, experiences, and perspectives to help shape the 2022 program. To submit your proposal, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash ISW2022. All right. So the title I came up with here is uh, to err is human, but on the blockchain, errors are forever. And this is one of those things that's just kind of... Um, kind of got me, you know, especially looking at the history of blockchain. There's so many examples, uh, like everybody knows somebody who mined a thousand bitcoins and, and then forgot what they did with the hard drive, right? <laughs> How many times have you heard that, Tyler? A lot. Or you've lost a jump drive a lot. <laughs> or, yeah, uh, in uh, did you see the uh, Joe Grand video that dropped in the last week or two where he was able to break into a, a Trezor cold wa wallet and recover yep. two million? Yep, that was very interesting, and the way he did it was uh, was pretty awesome. He got he got a little lucky, we'll call it luck, but he was very technical in how he found um, that vulnerable version that they had patched. So uh, we'll kind of talk about cold storage wallets here in a little bit, uh, but the Trezor mm -hmm. wallet was is one of the ones that is very, very secure. And he was able to get into that because of a, uh, a security patch on it. So it was pretty cool to see. Yeah, so, and, and this happens at so many levels, like on an individual consumer level, you know, there's the the worry that you forget how to get into your wallet. Like in this case, where they're recovering the Trezor wallet, like they had put some crypto on there, completely forgot about it. And then years later, they, they can't find their paper key, they can't find their pin. 
and so they can't get back into it. And you only get so many guesses and it locks you out forever. Um, but then there's, you know, on the more business level, on the exchange and the, you know, the folks running hot wallets and, and services and things like that, um, you know, there, there have been some very high profile hacks here uh, recently with Crypto.com and then with uh, with Wormhole. You know, and I thought Crypto.com was bad. You know, Wormhole came in, said, hold our beer and lost 10 times more than that. So uh, something like over 330 million. But um, but yeah, you, you know, I guess you know, the main thing for me and what I found really interesting here recently was that after uh, Crypto.com lost that money, they put a guarantee into place that looked very similar to what, you know, like an FDIC guarantee. And I think it's even the same amount. It's like a quarter million that they'll guarantee, um, which I think is going to go a long way to... Uh, you know, help increase confidence in in consumers uh, hold, holding that kind of money with somebody. I think that I think that is a good step in the right direction, kind of. But then you start to question: okay, if they're going to do that, like, are we still decentralized? Do these insurance companies have uh, stakes and visibility? Like, how is that actually happening? Uh, and where where is that money coming to fund that? Because no one does that for free, right? So. As part of these exchanges, that means your fees are probably going to be higher. But you know, some people would probably pay a higher fee to have some of their their crypto insured, and especially when you're using exchanges where um, it's a custodial exchange versus uncustodial, uncus un then the the risk and onus and, and your trust in the exchange definitely has to apply to that, and you have to have the uh, the ability to make the consumer feel okay and have some guarantees around that. And usually that's based off of mm -hmm. reputation or size uh, and some good security. But we've seen that bigger places have been the ones that have gotten breached and done some really bad things in smart contracts. So, Yeah, so do you think that's uh, for people to ha basically be able to trust these companies and, and be comfortable, uh, you know, and just for a lot of this to hit more mainstream? Uh, and, and to really kind of achieve utility where you can go spend this uh, more places, you can use it for more things. Do you think it's going to be table stakes, having some kind of guarantee uh, on that money? I don't think that's actually the real big issue for the general public to or, or for why the general public hasn't gotten into crypto quite as much. I mean, we have the ability to use a, a crypto debit card. You've got MasterCard and, and Visa both that have uh, are working with like. Uh, Crypto.com, uh, Coinbase, all of these have like debit cards and features to spend this uh, via fiat right there uh, as a regular transaction. So the convenience and the use is pretty straightforward. The apps are you know just like Venmo or Cash App, like they're very straightforward. I think a lot of the consumer hesitation is uh, they don't understand it. In the early days, crypto has always been, and I, I just got done talking to someone that's fairly technical. They still think that crypto is used uh, on the dark web by hackers only. It's an anonymous mm -hmm. coin, very, very unstable. It's how you buy drugs, like things like that. Those kind of nuances around what crypto was maybe in the early days or used for as you know partial things uh, is still the stigma that the general population has, and they don't fully understand how it's working, what the stability is, how fiat and exchanges are interacting, and even the simplicity of apps and how those apps can be used for, for regular money to avoid inflation. Um, it's a very unstable market, just like the stock market is. You, you don't have a debit card for stocks uh, that go up and down on, on the right. daily. So I can see some of that hesitation, and it is very difficult to track some of this fluctuation in the market that you know, crypto is following the regular stock market and regular fiat exchanges as far as up and downs. But uh, the the overall picture of what crypto is, I think, scares people because they just don't understand it. Yeah, I think one of the things that it's it seemed to me with crypto, like a lot of people seem to think that just one of them is going to win, you know, and, and be the only cryptocurrency we use. And, and personally, there's so many with different features. I see it more likely that there's a crypto that we use. Uh, you know, for small, frequent purchases. You know, there's a crypto that you'd use to to buy a house or you know make a large purchase. You know, there there's uh, some crypto have smart contracts baked in, some don't. You know, so there's I, I could see you know a dozen or more of these surviving and fitting into 
do you see it that same way? Like, like some of them fit into different niche use cases. Like you, you wouldn't ever want to just use one. Yeah, I mean that that is that is why we have so many altcoins, and that is kind of one of the other misconceptions that a lot of people have is you know people are just making altcoins to to make a bunch of money and, and get out. And the reality is that the majority of these altcoins and the way that their their programming and backend uh, blockchains work are for very specific problems and purposes. They're trying to solve different things. You've got some that are are specifically being built for uh, nonprofits. Uh, so that they can function with inside of smart contracts that work very, very uh, favorable for, for nonprofits and, and certain types of orgs. Uh, there's others that are very, very quick for transaction and block validation so that they can handle things like uh, credit card transactions. You know, something like Visa, uh, the credit card transaction, they can handle like 63,000 transactions a second. Now, that's very, very difficult to do right. with scaling a network and doing that decentralized. But some of these uh, blockchains are building their network in a very specific manner in order to take some of that load and start to make that a uh, very quick transaction that costs you know one to five dollars for the bank and put it down to 0 0.001 pennies and do it in roughly the same amount with the same volume capability based on the block and the staking that is happening uh, for each of those coins. So uh, each of these coins has different pros and cons in the way that you use them um, outside of just buying them with a fiat and you know hoping they go up or down, which there's investment strategies around some of that. Uh, the backing of the smart contracts and how they use programming, uh, which banks are leveraging those between exchanges and, and different blockchains. There's, there's a ton of things that are going on outside of just uh, crypto having a monetary value. These are being used for very specific things. And there's a lot of banks backing a lot of these things. So people uh, are very wary of altcoins, but you start to look at some of the smart contracts and big you know, AIG, some of the bigger uh, banks, Cap One, a bunch of the, the European banks, all of these back-end banks are leveraging some form of smart contract to execute um, non-reputable contracts and money exchanges. It's, it's very simple and, and effective from a monetary standpoint to make sure that you get paid and make sure that these contracts are executed on. So uh, I, I think once people start to understand how stable these are, how many big companies are leveraging these for day-to-day -day transactions and operations, and then what each coin is used for, yeah, you can build some strategy around, hey, where you keep your money uh, and what you do with w which coins you actually put money into. But I think some of that is more for the general consumer. You're really trying to come up with a strategy on which exchange has low exchange rates between fiats and currencies, which ones has security features you're trying to do, and then your strategy for the ones that you're investing in. Are you keeping those in a cold wallet? Are you keeping those in a hot wallet? And, and kind of breaking that out so the general consumer knows, you know, what they're doing outside of just which coins they're using. It's it's what you're doing on which platform and who's managing what parts of those. Yep. Right. Yeah. So, so there's uh, two directions we could go here. I think the first I want to cover, you know, start big and, and go down to consumer, you know, so at, at the larger level, we've seen some criminal cases where uh, law enforcement was able to recover funds, uh, assuming that, you know, maybe an exchange that they went to was within, uh, you know, U.S. jurisdiction and they were able to to get that money back. You know, what's the likelihood that, you know, stolen crypto can be recovered? And, and is there, you know, even though it's decentralized, you know, are, are, is there regulation coming, you know, that might make it easier to recover stolen crypto? <laughs> Now, there's a ton of regulation happening right now, especially for exchanges with inside the United States and the ability for um, for prosecutors and criminal justice to work with those exchanges. Almost all the exchanges have to have uh, some form of validation uh, if they're requested, even if they're ones that do some, uh, somewhat anonymous exchanges, if they're with inside the United States uh, and there's a request or a subpoena, then they have to request the user um uh, provide the additional information. There's a process that that's all called. Uh, where it's an exchange, there's also the ones where you can get some um, attribution and they'll work with law enforcement, especially in the United States. There's others where uh, law enforcement's able to recover a lot of these transactions because crypto isn't anonymous anymore. The blockchains are all public. You can track these uh, these transactions and validate them, and there's very, very high-end right systems to to do this tracing and, and algorithms and follow the money 
And then once they follow the money and, and get attribution on a wallet, um, like we've seen with the, the couple in New York, uh, they were able to recover a bunch of this money because they were able to get a subpoena to access their digital accounts where they were storing their keys. So they were storing keys online or with inside of something on a computer or a web browser or something. And from those keys, they were able to uh, transfer out and recover some of that crypto. So we've seen... Uh, DOJ do several recovery efforts from ransomware groups and such, and that's almost certainly done through the recovery of the keys via either physical access or digital access that they've been granted via subpoena. All right, and, and, and now let's shrink it down to foot gunning, you know, and, and individual consumer advice here. You know, it seems like you probably wouldn't want to put all your all your crypto on a single cold wallet. You know, I assume like, you know, if you have an electronics failure or something like that, uh, you know, but I was doing some research and it looks like you can back up some of these cold wallets, you know, so that, um, you know, maybe you could buy the same model and do like a recovery or something like that. Like, like what what would you re recommend for people managing their, their own uh, cryptocurrency security wise and and to make sure that, you know, losing a cold wallet or, you know, that, that they don't flush all their cash at once by making a mistake. So there's a couple different strategies to do this. And then there's, there's multiple ways to do this really well. The, the kind of high level, high level things that need to be handled and done properly are your cold wallet. Everyone should probably have a cold wallet. And I typically, I leverage my cold wallet for a few things. I leverage my cold wallet for anything that has a very large sum of money, uh, anything that I'm not going to be moving around and I'm investing in for a substantial amount of time. Uh, I keep those with inside the cold wallet. As part of your cold wallet though, you have what's called your recovery keys. And your recovery keys are typically 12 or 24 um, passphrases or, or words that you can leverage uh, should your wallet become inaccessible you can actually use those recovery uh, words to maintain or get access back to your uh, your token and whatever you have with inside of the wallet and so you've got two pieces that you really need to capture uh, and protect and how you do that there's a couple of ways to do that but one your cold wallet once you set that up you make sure you're backing up those uh, those recovery keys and those recovery keys, they make some really interesting um, like steel cases where you have the words and you actually put the, the words in order and screw the, the steel cases. They're all laser etched or, or steel engraved uh, words. So even if there was a fire, uh, you wouldn't lose oh, wow. those words. Wrote it on a paper. This is a very, very common thing, and you know most crypto hardware wallets uh, offer this as something you can purchase. You can find them all over, all over Amazon and uh, uh, the internet. But those words, they come, you know, pre-populated, and you can fill in, and you can do that in such a way where you're only putting the first four characters of each word. And there's a way to decrypt those with two different uh, sets of of words, and you you know what those are. And so you need to back up your recovery keys, put those into something that's not going to burn if your house burns down or you lose your wallet. Uh, and additionally, uh, making sure that you're leveraging secure computers, you're not storing uh, storing these in your your password safe. That's a browser extension. You know, I don't you know keep your LastPass, uh, your your recovery wallet keys with inside your LastPass or anything that can be compromised. If your local machine can be compromised, which AKA your your password vault potentially could be compromised. Uh, that's probably not a good place to keep these if there's a large sum of money. So that's why they have these offline uh, kind of, it's almost like a Rolodex, except it's made out of metal or steel. And there's some that, you know, if you get fireproof, you can put paper inside of a, a steel tube. However you do it, make sure you back those up and make sure you have a strategy around. And if it gets wet, someone spills something on it, uh, you've got a flood, a fire, all of those things uh, become very important. So making sure that's one part, and maybe even shipping the second part to your bank, put it in a, a safety deposit box as a backup in case you know. Almost a bit of irony there, I, keep, keeping your de decentralized currency uh, in a bank. <laughs> yeah, or send it send it to your best friend that you trust, and uh, right. you know maybe have uh, have that locked up some some other way. But you know, just keeping it outside of your your general geographic location or, or premise is probably a good solution. But uh, that's for the cold wallet piece. And, and there's a couple good strategies. Like I maintain four or five different wallets. One, I've got an app that's very convenient to use if I want to buy crypto instantly while I'm you know, laying in bed at midnight or something. I see a price drop. Uh, I've got an app 
and I usually use you know Kraken or Coinbase or one of the the bigger ones. Uh, but leveraging that with a two factor, uh, all of these have the ability to set up two factor for purchasing and for transferring. Uh, in fact, there's multiple levels of two factor on things like Kraken and Coinbase. So you get that for buying and keeping, you know, your your daily spend stuff, or maybe it's your quick investment one. And then you've got a separate one where you keep uh, some spending cash. And I usually only keep a couple hundred bucks in in that one. And that's the one that's tied to the debit card that if I lost a debit card, you know, you can shut that off. But it's very quick use crypto in case I need to pay someone. If I want to use some crypto for something specific, uh, that's a, a separate app from the one I'm, you know, investing and moving uh, stuff between exchanges on. Because you have to remember each time you're doing some of these things, uh, you're getting charged exchange fees. You're getting charged right. fiat to crypto fees. The apps uh, have fees themselves. So uh, you can lose a lot of money by doing uh, any one of these uh, strategies too often. So figuring out which app, trying to stay with inside the same blockchain for certain aspects of, of what you're doing, and then maintaining kind of those segregated levels of security between uh, what you're trying to accomplish with that particular crypto platform. Yeah. Yeah. I what, think what Lee the had questions a question. I'm, I'm having, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm thinking this right now, crypto is. Uh, you got to be have a really smart, up-to-date user. You don't just go to your banking app that now supports crypto and start using it. You have to understand about cold wallets and exchanges and what costs what. It kind of remembers reminds me of back when we were building our S100 bus computers, where you really had to know a lot. Versus now, you just go to the go to Best Buy and buy a computer. Mm -hmm. Where do you? I mean, do you think that it's going to come to a point where it's not so much? needing all this acumen about crypto or is it going to remain something where you really got to have your your head together and know all the ins and outs for a long time so right actually fairly easy and i, I just helped a couple of really non-technical friends get some stuff set up if you're not going real crazy you're not spending a ton of money and you're you know you can afford to you know play with 50 bucks play with 500 bucks any one of those kind of things you can start to just do some of the app-based uh, things such as Coinbase. Coinbase Wallet um, is a, a great example in the Coinbase app. So you've got Coinbase app, which is an exchange, right? And you've got the Coinbase Wallet, which is a secondary app that integrates into that exchange. Now, the Coinbase, um, the Coinbase Wallet is a, a non-custodial wallet. So you maintain the keys. And that's one of the, the key differences between cold wallets, some of these apps and exchanges you're using, as well as um, the way in which you're conducting very easy transactions. So Coinbase Wallet is a non-custodial, meaning you own the private keys. The private keys are stored on your device, and you're responsible for backing up that uh, and maintaining it. Now that's fairly simple with this app. It gives you, you know, tells you to write your 12 words down, store those safely. Uh, your keys are all handled by a thumbprint, and then your interaction to the exchange it hooks right up to your bank account. And you can buy crypto and, and spend crypto with the debit card. So, really, it's no more difficult than you know Facebook Pay, Google Pay, Apple Pay, any of these other apps you're using. It looks very similar. So now it's gotten to the point where it is very easy, which also is kind of scary because regular users are losing money be, by not doing some of the fundamental things that they've not had to do with their bank. You know, Twelve character passphrase is not something that everybody's used to or storing that right. safely. So keeping some of those small things in mind, the small details, but the use cases now, the general public should be able to do uh, and buy crypto very, very easily on most of these exchanges and using some of these apps. I mean, Meta app, uh, MetaMask is a, another one on the uh, the platform that's non-custodial, you've got uh, a ton of ways to do some of this where you've got other ones like Kraken and and I think it's even uh, one of the other banks just released a, a big one where you can purchase and it's on exchange and they're custodial. They handle all your public keys. So mm -hmm. everything's managed by you know your password and two-factor just like your bank is. So it's very, very local easy. credit union. Yes, yes, that is right? true. That was crazy. I, I, I was not expecting to see a credit union jumping into crypto this early. But yeah, I figured, you know, crypto.com is advertising at Formula One, the Super Bowl, like as widely as they're advertising. I, I've got to think it's probably pretty easy to use. Yeah. So I was actually thinking Tyler could write the Crypto for Dummies book. Um, it sounds like you've just got so much. We just There's recorded the intro. Yeah. 
Now, there's a lot of people that are way, way smarter at the crypto stuff than I am. I'm, I'm very niche as far as like what I'm looking at, how I'm going about what I'm investing in, looking at the exchanges, looking at the technology, doing you know, ton around some of the mining. There's, there's multiple layers you can get involved in that are very interesting from a technology standpoint that are outside of just you know, buying and selling crypto like an investor. There's some technologies on the blockchain that are leveraging you know, you've got NFTs, you've got mining capabilities, you've got uh, proof of work versus proof of stake, uh, validators, uh, RPC networks, all these things that we've kind of dabbled in as technologists. Uh, there's lots of interesting places to get involved in. Even if you're a dev or, or doing code, a lot of the Web 3.0 and smart contracts and, and DeFi uh, coding projects that are going on to solve the world's problems in one form or another, like all of those are very interesting if you are kind of just starting to figure this out and wanting to know more about uh, blockchain and or what the use cases are. So I, I think technologists have shied away because it had a kind of a negative connotation like AI and ML, uh, etc. And we've not understood the full capability of what people are developing, what Web 3.0 is, how things are working, and, and what's being integrated into it. So we just chunked everything into crypto and blockchain and, and kind of left it there. But there's a lot going on, and I think there's a lot of people that would be very interested in some of the stuff happening if they took the time to read. It's very, uh, it's a little daunting to start, uh, and there's a lot of great yeah. resources. It takes a little bit of looking. Yeah, no, they, I think this has been an excellent primer, and it's... Um, yeah, I think I think the hype got to such levels that a lot of people have have really started to underestimate, you know, what it what it can do. Like, you know, like you said, just associating it with cybercrime and stuff like that. Um, but honestly, it's moved so quickly; it's it's been tough uh, to keep. Uh, I've been trying to keep up with it, and still, like, <laughs> I need you to come on here and explain a lot of this stuff to me uh, and uh, fill in the gaps for me. But um, but. Thanks, Tyler, for jumping on, on on such short notice and and giving us this this great uh, primer into uh, uh, some of these crypto topics. Absolutely, yeah, and I, I think this is a great uh, a great time and point where we can begin to to write out some resources, maybe do a couple small micro segments on on very individual topics. You know how mm -hmm. to do secure browsing, how to do set up, you know, cold wallets, hot wallets, all the all the little nuances that people may be a little wary to get into, but um, I think some of the primer uh, around what blockchain is, how it's happening, where it's working, uh, those things are important. You've got the, the high level that we've just covered just to, just to get the intro going. So uh, hopefully we can release some more uh, resources and get people a little bit more comfortable with why this is a good idea and why things are moving in the right directions and, and why there's so many mistakes happening and why there's a lot of bad ideas as well as part of this uh, this whole uh, evolution that's that's going to happen so yeah all right excellent thank you tyler and stay tuned when we come back we're going to talk about the state of identity in the enterprise with brandon williams from ping identity <laughs> <laughs> 